This is the first podcast in a series focusing on assessment in world languages programs as part of a short course on assessment. This podcast will feature seven episodes with interviews with accomplished practitioners in world languages education as we break down assessment across the modes of communication. I am thrilled to welcome our first guest. Paul Sandrock is the Director of Education at the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages and author of Planning Curriculum for Learning World Languages and The Keys to Assessing Language Performance, a Teacher's Manual for Measuring Student Progress. Welcome, Paul. We're really glad you're with us today. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with all of you. Well, let's get started. How do performance assessments differ from other kinds of assessments a teacher might administer in a language class? I always think about assessment as a journey, a journey from the point of learning something to the point of showing what I can do with what I know. And so I think about the difference in performance assessment is that it is not assessment at that immediate point when I just have taught you a new word or you have just been exposed to some structure or it's the first time you've ever been able to ask a question. But it is a little further down that journey and the further I get away from that point of learning, the closer I get to what I would say is real assessment of language proficiency because when it's really close to the moment that I learned something, when I was taught something, then it has those elements of, well, of course it's gonna be just perfect. Of course it's gonna be a high expectation of accuracy because you just learned it. I don't have all these other things competing in my head, but the further I move away from that point of learning those words, acquiring a structure, learning to ask questions or describe things, some language function, the further I get away, the closer I'm getting to proficiency, but also my criteria for evaluating it change. So let me just give some examples. Um, right when I, I've done something in my classroom that is, again, either a vocabulary or a structure or a function, and I, I'm, I'm helping my students learn that, I will do some ongoing checks for learning. Those ongoing checks for learning are only intended to know, did my students meet that can-do goal for that lesson at that point in time? So I might use a quick um, thumbs up, thumbs down. I understand I don't. It might be, do you think this person wants you to do A or B as you are using what you just learned to just make some response? Uh, it may be, um, uh, again, an exit ticket would be a quick, ongoing check for learning. You got it. I can go on. I don't have to spend much more time on the input side of, of the equation. Um, I want to move into a performance assessment, which starts out at a more formative level to say, can students use what they've learned now in a communicative task? Not just focusing on, you've got the words, give me the words. You understand the structure, show me you understand the structure, right? You know how to form questions, form questions. That's devoid of meaning. So right away when I'm trying to assess with a performance lens in place, I'm putting it into some application. Can the students use what they've learned in a communicative task would be one step away from that point of learning and it's a more formative assessment. And I'm, I'm getting evidence of, oh, you're starting to move away from teacher helped you get there to you can do this on your own as a student, as a learner. Further down that journey, a little further away from that point of learning, sort of a little, little further from my, my focus on just the vocabulary and the structures and the functions even, would be a more summative assessment where I'm really trying to know, can you apply independently in a communicative task those things that you learned? So now it is less dependent on the teacher, it's less dependent on the structure that I set up around the assessment, and that is an assessment of your performance. Once you leave the classroom 
now we're in a more pure proficiency um, environment because there is no teacher. There is no scaffolded structure. The voice I hear is not what I'm familiar with. I just have to deal with it. And so that is the, the difference of uh, how I differentiate performance assessment within my own classroom and how I make sure that I'm preparing them for the ultimate performance out in the real world, the world of, of proficiency. Thank you. I think it was really helpful for teachers and all of us to hear that kind of distinction between those really quick checks that are happening during the instructional moment and right after the instructional moments up to more formative performance assessments to the summative assessment as you get further and further and further away from the moment of initial learning all the way up to true proficiency, which is completely you know, devoid of access to the teacher, the notes, the resources, and truly dependent on everything that you have inside. So that was a really helpful way to break that down. And if um, I could just add, yeah. if I could just add uh, also, I think that there is in, a, in the, a performance assessment, I have to make sure that I am focusing on meaning and on meaningful communication. So it is not just that, that practice of, um, I want you to use the future tense. Uh, I want you to use these three vocabulary words. So you're opening it up to allow the learner to show more and more what can they do with what they know. It's not just I'm checking that you have the no part. Those might be my ongoing checks for learning. And then I have to start to realize, well, wait a minute. Anytime I assess, I don't find out everything you can do. I don't find out everything you know, because the more that you're in, in this, uh, this language learning environment, there's a lot that you have in your head. So it's consider it just a snapshot. And a snapshot only captures a small portion. I try to take a picture of a beautiful sunset and it never looks as good as the real thing. I try to catch a snapshot of what my learners can do in an assessment, and it's never as good as the real thing. And I have to keep that in mind. And what I'm getting is not so much all the little details, but a bigger picture of, wow, given all that you could do in this one circumstance where I asked you to have this conversation or respond to this message or create a message, what could you do in that, in that small snapshot? And that, again, is how I want, to, I want to keep that in mind as I'm designing performance assessment versus assessment of just all the little pieces that you know. Yeah, I even had written down in my notes that you know, these assessments are both rich in context and rich in meaning um, in their tasks. And they're also not about you know, catching every mistake that the learners could possibly make with this, you know, with the language. That's not the focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that clarification as well. So if I were to give a learner an oral task prompt to assess their speaking, would that be a performance assessment? And if not, what's the critical difference? That's such a good question. And it's one we ask ourselves all every day in, as we're preparing for the classroom. And I would say, unfortunately, it just depends. <laughs> I know everyone wants this hard and fast answer like, oh, that's, that's definitely a, a performance assessment or no, it's not. It's like, you know, it's not just that it, there is an oral task or a constructed prompt that is the difference. It's the nature of the task and the nature of the prompt, I think. So if the prompt is something like, um, describe what you are wearing you would look at me and say, uh, we're looking at each other, even if it's virtual. Uh, why would you ask such a stupid question? So that would be so contrived, there is no movement from the teacher directing it all to what would I do in real situations? As we said, it has to be, what, what can you do with what you've learned in some communicative need? So the task has to have some need to actually use the language. So that would be, I would say, that is not a performance assessment. You're just trying to trick me into showing the vocabulary that you hope I learned, right? Versus, oh, you're at a restaurant and you get a text from your friend that she just arrived, but she can't find you. What are you gonna do? You get on your phone and say, uh, can't, you, can't you see me? Well, I'm wearing a, and you're gonna describe what you're wearing. But now it is in a meaningful communicative exchange 
because it's not obvious. You can't see me. If you turned off your, your, your uh, uh, camera, Nicole, and I asked, well, what are you doing right now? It's a logical question. But looking at you, it's like, that would be the most ridiculous thing possible to ask. So I think it's, it's as, we, as we are trying to think about, is this truly a performance assessment? We have to just go through some criteria and ask ourselves, um, is it pretty close to real life? Is this something that someone would actually do with language or is it just contrived for the classroom? So if I want it to be a performance assessment, it has to be closer to real life. I would say it also needs to have a communicative purpose, which of course comes from real life. That communicative purpose might be that I need to find out some information or we are discussing some ideas or we are exchanging opinions or I'm telling you a story or I'm, I'm trying to convince you of something. All of those communicative purposes are, are very real and very natural. And I wanna make that the heart of my performance assessment. Again, I want to know what you can do with what you know is at the heart of performance assessment, not just can you use these five verbs? Can you put them in the right form? Can you, you know, uh, change it into another, another context? Um, that is, those are the criteria that I need to, to think about always when I am uh, looking to make sure that my assessment is in the performance realm and not just tied again to, I, I'm trying to find out what you, what you know. Those are those ongoing checks for learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, something that as a teacher I was always working on was really to make sure that my students saw every you know, every task that we did, particularly as we arrived at the assessment tasks, that they actually saw themselves as engaging in meaningful, you know, communication experiences that made sense to them as something you would do with the language. And um, that it wasn't about every adjective agreement and so on, um, as far as if we're going to do an oral task prompt, for example, for speaking. I really liked that example that shows how you could still get the same information from your learners about whether or not they happen to know enough vocabulary to make it through um, a task that requires them to show clothing vocabulary, but put it into a context that actually makes sense and would be something we would do outside of the classroom because we're not preparing our students to stay in the classroom. We're not preparing our students to ultimately pass a series of grammar tests. We're preparing them hopefully to communicate with people virtually and in person around the world using these language skills. Uh, language teachers are focusing a great deal on the three modes of communication as they are embedded in both the national standards and state standards for learning languages. So how do these modes of communication relate to assessing performance? that really gets to the heart of why you are engaging in this task. Because the modes of communication are not just what they look like on the surface, listening, speaking, reading, writing. That we can isolate and test. Can you listen? Can you speak? Can you read? Can you write? That can be devoid of any meaning and I can get evidence you can do those things. But in a performance assessment, it's like, well, how are you using that type of communication for a meaningful purpose. Uh, to me, the modes are all about the purpose of the communication. And I always think about that then as my assessment has to reflect the purpose behind the mode. So if we think about um, the interpretive mode, it is described as understand, interpret, and analyze. So an assessment that simply says, well, what is the meaning of this word? how would you translate this paragraph is not getting to the full purpose behind the interpretive mode of communication. That is when I am engaged again, thinking of those criteria in real life in an interpretive task, like I've just listened to uh, someone speaking on the radio. I watched a news program. I saw a movie. I have never in my life in real life been asked to do a 10 point multiple choice test at the end of those. So that assessment does not match the purpose of the task. So my assessment of the interpretive mode should not go in that direction. It should be, what do you normally do? After you have listened to um, a news story, for example, I reflect on it and say, 
wow, what's different today that I know about that, that um, story compared to what we knew about it yesterday? Just think every day, a news story, you add more, you add more, you add more information. So that would be a more natural task. What did you learn from this that you didn't know the day before? Um, after you, after you uh, watch a movie, you usually don't retell every single detail. You make some comment about, wow, you should really see this movie because, and you share the things that what surprised you, what you didn't like, um, why it's worthwhile, how it might compare to some others. I mean, all of those are natural reactions. And so I think in assessing, we need to think about those modes of communication and the purpose behind them. Okay, I've been dwelling a lot on interpretive. Let me think about the other modes as well. Um, in presentational, it's all about creating a message. And you are creating a message for a specific audience. So my assessment task should tell me, well, what are you trying to get across and to whom? So as I set up that task, I would say to myself, um, in this presentational moment, are you informing or explaining something? Are you trying to persuade someone? Or are you just narrating and telling a story? And actually, that's what's embedded in the presentational mode standard. It says inform, explain, narrate, or persuade. So I think about that purpose, and then I would want to make sure that, that my learners in the assessment know, and who are you trying to convince if it's a persuasive um, uh, task that I set forth? Is it a peer? Is it someone younger? Is it your mother? Is it your neighbor? Is it the governor? Who are you trying to persuade? Because now I can show, wow, I know how to um, rise to a certain level of proficiency given my purpose and my audience in the presentational mode or not. Maybe I still have the novice level and I just am happy to get the message out there. I don't care if you're the governor or my best friend, it's coming out the same way, like a good novice should, right? Like a good novice would. Um, in the interpersonal, Again, I think the, the purpose is critical. I have to set up my task so that there is a need to exchange and negotiate meaning because that's what it talks about in the, in the standard itself. Interact and negotiate meaning in order to exchange ideas, exchange stories, exchange um, opinions, um, um, negotiate to meet some need like convincing your teacher why you should be excused from this test, right? Um, all of those are real tasks, real audiences, and that's how the modes, I think, come beautifully into the world to help me really um, develop better performance assessments. Yeah, I'm really hearing a theme start to emerge in the questions in the sense that both purpose for the tasks as well as a meaningful context are really critical to um, the design of tasks. And so if we're looking at those modes for communication within each mode, we really have to think about what that mode kind of elicits in terms of, you know, whether it is understanding and interpreting or analyzing versus creating those messages for specific audiences versus sharing information in a collaborative dialogue. We have to think about all of that and still think about that context, that purpose, that real situation in each case. So I'm really appreciating hearing that theme develop throughout. So in your book, The Keys to Assessing Language Performance, you actually list seven steps for designing performance assessment tasks. Which of the steps do you find are more challenging for teachers to incorporate in their planning and why? Sure, sure. Well, I think, I think the, the opening piece that we've already really talked about is what's, the, what's the, the focus of the task itself? Is it engaging? Is it rich? And I think that's teachers, teachers know their students, so they know what's going to be appealing. So that I don't think is so challenging. But then I need to know, well, what do they actually need to do to demonstrate their learning? And I find that step right there is a challenge because we are so trained and so it's so ingrained in our, in our thinking of being a teacher that I need to test everything that I taught, which is not the world of performance assessment. I, we, we've had a ton of input. We've had a ton of input, but there's no way that all of that is at my command for whatever the output might be, to show that I understood, to show that I can create a message, to show that I can exchange information. 
all of that input, I have to make sure that it is now, what are you going to demonstrate that shows you're a pretty good novice? Or wow, you've moved over into that intermediate realm because of, and I list the things that it, you are now showing me. So it's a shift from measuring what was taught to really what can learners do with what they know. And I, I find that as one of the big, the big challenges. Um, and then we, we talk about um, uh, another, another area is making sure that as I do all my brainstorming and I just say, oh, here are all the possible things that I'm gonna throw into this unit. And then I start to sort them out and say, well, these are gonna come early on and these are gonna come more at the middle and this is more at the end. I start to think of, well, if I'm really trying to assess, how do I know they're ready for what I finally designed as my summative? And so I start to sort out, well, this would be a good point after this end of this first week, for example. If they can do this, we are really on track to hit the point I want to be in nine weeks. About halfway through, are they showing that they can more independently now perform show that performance assessment, some formative assessment um, uh, elements at that point, um, that they are on track to, to make it towards, towards the summative. And I think that is, is an important piece. And also it, the, the challenge of dividing this into formative and summative is that we think, well, summative is always like the last day or the last three days. And it really shouldn't be. Um, I, I always celebrated when my students would stop saying, is this going to be on the test? And they would just say, oh, oh, like, did, did you just, was that like a little assessment we just did? And they would only know that it was an assessment because I gave them perhaps more formal feedback. Otherwise, I was giving them feedback all the time. We were doing all these tasks. And that line between, you know, learning and practicing and a formative assessment and a summative assessment, it got nicely blurred, I think appropriately blurred. So they just realized it was more independent as we got closer to the summative and you got um, probably more structured feedback. So those were some, some of the things that I think that's, that's a hard one too, sometimes to, to think about the, that, that movement from formative to summative. And the last I would share is then sort of fine tuning and integrating the assessments uh, because a lot has been spoken about integrating assessment and in the original project, the Integrated Performance Assessment Project, it was very tightly structured that there had to be an interpretive and then an interpersonal and then a presentational. Uh, just for consistency, to see if the integration actually worked. But as I work with teachers more and more, I realize that it isn't so much that strict um, sequence, but it is that all of the modes support each other. So I might start with something that is interpretive to get some input and some ideas, or maybe I took time to do a presentational task earlier on, and that summative happened earlier on in the unit because it was where you can control the text. And when you're creating something, you're thinking about it, you're getting all your ideas down, you've written it down perhaps, maybe you've even done like a, an oral presentation with it, those presentational mode summative tasks, if they came earlier on in the unit, they are preparing me for the more spontaneous conversation or a deeper interpretive because I already have a lot of vocabulary and a lot of ideas about the topic through another, another type of assessment. So I, I think that is, that is another challenge of how do you integrate the assessments and not think about it as it all has to happen in one day and the last day. So I would say those are three, unfortunately, three out of the seven I've just labeled as kind of challenging, but it's just about a mindset shift. And the more that teachers start moving in this direction, it just becomes your way of thinking and doing, and the challenge part goes away because you've built wonderful repertoire and have great experiences. And of course, you're gonna see the feedback from your students that are saying, wow, that's like no assessment I ever had before but I really learned something from it. I really liked it. Like, wow, that is what uh, we want all our students to say all the time, right? Yes, I loved it when my students actually were leaving um, a portion of one of my integrated performance assessments with the reading and the interpretive tasks. And as they were leaving, I was listening to them all talk about how much they learned while doing the tasks. And similarly, that sense of, 
you know, your, your discussion about appropriately blurred lines between the different types of assessment in which we're going to engage all throughout these learning experiences with our learners, um, you know, really it's, it is a challenge because it's a shift in the way people think about, you know, the maybe a traditional approach to where, like you said, summative was always at the last day of a unit and then you started something brand new, for example. But once you do get into it, you're absolutely right. It actually flows a lot more naturally. Um, it's all driven by building on students' experiences and demonstrated knowledge and skills. Um, and they don't, they end up not needing to ask if this is going to be on the test. That was also one of my favorite moments. I love that. I also really liked your description, you know, even just really brief description of the integrated performance assessment as being one in which all of the modes of communication support each other. That's something I like to tell teachers as well. And for our listeners, we will have uh, the last two episodes of this series will actually be dedicated specifically to integrated performance assessment. One of the steps to designing performance assessment tasks is to evaluate the task against the targeted level of proficiency. So can you help our listeners understand what that might look like? Absolutely. It is the idea of really knowing what are the characteristics of the targeted level. Um, and it is, it is being realistic about that. So it is, to me, the can-do statements. The doc, that is going to be the document that I, that I turn toward because it has fully unpacked the uh, proficiency goals in a way that I can act on now in my, in my class. And I can, I can develop their proficiency and assess their proficiency because each can-do statement has three very important components. It says, I can, so it's not the teacher makes me do it. The teacher can pull it out of me. It's like, no, I can by myself independently. But then come the three important elements. There's a function. So I can um, um, provide and ask for information, right? Request and provide information. There's a function. Then there is a context. It's usually fairly generic, but then I take it into my classroom and I say, what would that look like in this unit? So I'm thinking of intermediate, low, interpersonal. I can request and provide information. So not just wait till I get asked questions, but I have to ask as well. Um, on familiar topics is the context. Okay, well, what if I'm not very familiar with the topic? Well, we create familiarity throughout the unit. That's why it's very appropriate at the intermediate low level. Doesn't mean they had to walk in the door with that familiarity, but we've spent several weeks so that by the end, if I want them to do something in intermediate low, I'm not gonna throw them a whole new context. I'm gonna give them something that they are at least familiar with enough to be able to request and provide information. So there's a function, a context, and I love the final piece because it gives me a sense of the how. It's not exactly just text type, that we talk about a lot in proficiency, but it, it describes it even more around what can I do to prepare my students so that they are ready? Because the how would, might be saying things like by creating sentences and series of sentences and asking appropriate follow-up questions. Oh, that's how I um, request information? Not just saying what, what, where, when, who, that would be very novice -y. At the intermediate low, it says, asking a variety of follow-up questions. Okay, so when I'm designing my task, I have to make sure that there's a need to negotiate enough such that you will ask follow-up questions. So I'm thinking of a unit around uh, making um, uh, healthy choices. And if I showed a variety of images of um, what people eat in a week, I, my prompt could be, um, where, what, what are these people eating and how similar is it to what you and your partner would eat in a week? Okay, I have to talk to my partner and find out what he or she eats in a week. We are going to discuss and see if we agree or not with the pictures that we are looking at. There's a lot back and forth. So they have to ask and provide information. They have to um, create sentences and series of sentences 
is not just this, 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 what, what. Uh, there's not a lot of comparison that can happen at a word level like that. So the idea of looking at my proficiency target help and then unpacking it really helps me design a much better assessment task. Yeah, I really, one of the things I talk a, a lot about with some of the teachers that I work with, and that's something that I worked on myself in my own language classes, was being sure that when I'm designing my tasks for both, both practice, of course, leading all the way up to and through the various types of assessment, was really being thoughtful about designing a task that is appropriate for the proficiency range that you're targeting. Because I think sometimes, um, without ever intending to, the, the tasks can be written in such a way where it's perfectly appropriate to answer with a one word answer. And then the student finds themselves getting dinged, so to speak, on the score because they didn't provide enough variety and, you know, use complete sentences and ask follow-up questions when the way the task was written, it was even to a native speaker, it would, be, it would have been perfectly appropriate to respond with just single word or short phrases. Yes, um, I love your, your coming back to the importance of the task itself. You know, instead of blaming the students and saying, oh, you didn't do what I asked you to do. It's like, we did exactly what you asked us to do. You said, tell someone about your day. It was fine. I'm telling you about my day. You didn't tell me to negotiate with my partner. What are three things that we should do if it's a really horrible day tomorrow? It's the conversation that you wanted, but it's not what you asked me for. <laughs> so I, you're exactly right. Once I understand the sort of that focus through the can-do statement, I then make sure that my task has those elements appropriate for that level. Is the function what I want? Is, do they have to provide that function, like request and provide information? Does it fit the context that's appropriate for them? Or is it too abstract? You know, we're not trying to solve world peace, but we down at the intermediate level can say, what are some things our school could do to reduce bullying? Oh, that's very practical and I can, that's, that I can function at that level, not abstractly. What are some things that would, you know, reduce stress across the world? Uh, I can't handle that, but I can handle what goes on in my school. Um, and then the, the how, the, the language piece, you know, it's making sure that you can't get away with just listing things, right? So thank you for bringing up the importance of the task. <laughs> Absolutely, because we really want to draw, we want to draw our learners proficiency, what they can do with the language. We want to draw that out of them and not accidentally, you know, do anything in the course of our instruction that might shorten that or shut that down in any way. Yes. Um, you devote a chapter in the book to the use of rubrics to evaluate and report on learner performance. So what would you say are the characteristics of a well-designed rubric? Yeah, you're going to hear some echoes of what I've been talking about already, <laughs> Nicole. Um, one of the key things to me is it has to be a realistic reflection, both of the proficiency level and really of real life, what counts. So what I see anytime I'm working with teachers around um, designing better rubrics, right away they start erasing perfect, 100% accurate, because in real life, that's unrealistic. Even at, if, I, if I'm speaking at the highest level, you have forgiven as a native speaker, as the language that we are exchanging right now, you have forgiven some of the mistakes in my uh, mm, er, moments in, in our conversation today, because we were focused on exchanging meaning and you were asking me to provide examples. And so I was trying to get beyond just novice words and phrases. <laughs> um, so it, the, the rubric has to reflect, again, real life. I also find that um, in, in, in talking about rubrics, that it is um, not just the reflection of the proficiency in the generic, but very much in the specific. So rather than being too global and too broad, really bring it down to this is what that intermediate low looks like. And I love the development more and more of one point or two point rubrics. So when I've been working with schools recently where they are um, developing one point rubrics, you say, okay, then what is our target? And using the example we just went through, if it's intermediate low and it's an interpersonal exchange, there has to be 
How do, what kind of questions did you ask? So not just you asked five questions or you can ask questions. That's too broad or too, too quantified versus quality, which is what a rubric should represent. Rubrics are about quality, not quantity. And so I would say, can you ask appropriate follow-up questions? Wow, that's my target. And then I can indicate if it's a one-point rubric, this is why you didn't meet it. This is how you exceeded it. The other criteria then, you can go one by one all the way through uh, the asking of questions, the providing of details versus just responding um, you know, with, with simple yes, no. So that would, that would be off the one point rubric and I could, I could identify what is exactly on that, on that scale. The two point nicely sets up, this is what I want you to be able to do. This is kind of what you're doing now and what growth are you showing? So I could say, you're asking questions, but they're kind of random, <laughs> right? I would like you to ask appropriate follow-up questions that stay, that keep the conversation on topic for the two minutes. Wow, that's a huge difference there. And I can indicate generally, as I listen to that two minute um, conversation, you were here or you were here, or it was mixed in the middle. So again, the idea of keeping it simple, describing what it is that you want, not being too abstract, or the, the rubrics that are like five by five squares where all everything is tiny little subtle, subtle, subtle nuances between each of those. It's like, it takes me an hour just to understand and read the rubric. Way too much, way too complicated. I, I like the simplification of a one point, a two point, at the most three, where I can say, this is the target, this exceeds, this is, this is quite not there yet. Um, and again, it all comes back to the levels of proficiency as, as we talked about. And when I design the rubric that way, showing these are the elements that will add up to being at that proficiency level, this will add up to being spot on on your performance, then day by day, we can practice one element. Today, when I'm giving you feedback on those pair activities you are doing, I'm just gonna give you feedback on how well you add in details. Or the next day, how well do you ask good follow-up questions? Because that's one of the elements of our rubric. So now the learners in their, in their development of their language skills aren't trying to think of everything, or you as the teacher, you're not trying to give feedback on every possible element, but you're focusing in on what do they need more practice and feedback on today, tomorrow, the next day, as we work towards the summit of assessment. So there was a lot of information there, but one of the, a couple of things that I wanted to pull out that um, something I really love about the one point rubric as well, you were talking about how with the rubrics that have like the five columns and all the little degradations, even as careful as people are when they write those rubrics, students always have always find a way in their responses to do something that's not accounted for in any of the language in any of the cells in those rubrics. And then the teacher finds themselves stuck. They aren't quite sure where to place the student. Whereas with the one point rubric you've identified or, or two point and so on, you've clearly identified what the target is. And now you have the freedom to clearly explain to the student what aspects of their performance met, exceeded, or didn't quite meet that target. And it's, it shows too how well a, feed, a rubric can be used to provide really meaningful and actionable feedback to learners, as well as communicate to other stakeholders like their families and, and elsewhere truly what it is that the student is showing that they're able to do and where they have room for growth. Um, we are already down to the last question. So for our final question, I was wondering if you can share one or two strategies for designing performance tasks that engage and motivate learners. Again, what a great question, Nicole. And here I just, every time I'm working with teachers, encourage them to really be respectful of their learners and to treat them for who they are not for their language level. Because it is so important that for the novice, you could be a three-year-old, you might be 10, you might be 15, you might be 39. Your language is still novice, but wow, the content, the task I give you is way different 
depending on your age and your developmental stage. So I have to just continually remind myself, oh yeah, it's not their brains that are at the novice level, it's simply their language. So make sure the content is rich and engaging and appropriate and something that it's worthwhile. Once you motivate students when they get excited about the topic, they're focusing on the right thing. Throughout, throughout our conversation, we've been saying we have to focus on the meaning, not just on all of the details, because that accuracy of all of the details of all the elements happens, we know, over a long period of time. In this, this class, I may only have you for nine months. We can't make that huge leap up to where your first language is in one year. So I make the choice of I'm going to give you exciting content that grabs you so that you are focused on the meaning because then you are motivated to stretch and push yourself and pull everything possible into getting that idea across, whether it's an interpersonal conversation, whether you're trying to understand something in the interpretive mode, whether you're trying to create a message and send it out, whatever mode you're in, you are so engaged. That to me is one of the key things when you're designing important performance assessment tasks because it makes the students let go a little bit because they're engaged by the meaning. We all know those students we have had who after four years in a program continue to just play it safe because they think accuracy is the only thing that matters. It isn't that accuracy doesn't matter. Life would be so much easier. Every student wants to be as accurate as possible because they can be more efficient. They can, they can get the job done faster. When they're struggling with words, when they're trying to circumlocute, they are really thinking and thinking and thinking. It's not coming easily. But in that struggle comes the growth, of course. So it's not about um, that the accuracy does not matter. It's simply, I don't want them so obsessed with accuracy that they never get out of the novice level because they're always playing it safe and they're giving very predictable sentences. And um, they just, you, they, they need to make sure that they push themselves. And that's how we can encourage that risk taking wherein lies all of the growth that's possible. Um, I think uh, it's also important that when designing performance assessments, we try out things that are similar in the class to make sure our students both understand what it is we're asking them to do, they have familiarity with it, and that then you also get the feedback on what tweaks, what improvements to the task might make it better and more effective. You know, the, the worst thing would be, we've done all this, this work in our class, and now finally we come to the summative assessment, and now I'm gonna say, okay, now write a persuasive response to this blog, disagreeing with the person that's there, and they're saying, we, we never did anything like that. And I'm thinking, well, you have all the words, yeah, but we didn't practice that kind of a thing. We didn't actually, in a moment, on an on-demand presentational task, anytime I had to do that, I had three hours at home to think about it. You're saying do it in 10 minutes. I've never done that. So the idea of practicing the type of task and even with the same kind of um, parameters that you're setting it up is, is a really critical thing because it will teach you as the teacher as much as it prepares the students. There we come I, back to the prompt again, don't we? There. <laughs> I really, but I really like what you brought up there and it's something that I also worked a lot on which was that sense of it was easy you know in teaching it's really easy to feel like you're constantly building up toward the assessment and then the assessment happens and you've built up to something that the students never had a chance to try um, and that i find that to be particularly true uh with presentational and interpersonal modes um you know it's it's something that i'm finding teachers are working towards shifting. How can I provide my learners opportunities to also practice and get feedback on presentational tasks that maybe represent a piece of what the ultimate presentational task will be and get feedback on it and, and have a chance to actually experience the kind of language and the, sim the type of situations in which they'll be asked to communicate when they ultimately do have that assessment. I also really liked what you said. You 
really drove home in a very clear way why it is that we see our novice speakers in our year four and five classes speaking at the high school level, for example, and that sense of their fear of being wrong and their fear of risk taking and their comfort zone with the novice level phrase that they can execute perfectly on demand, right? And so the importance for us as teachers to really help all learners you know, experience language and be comfortable with taking risks and understanding that making mistakes is a normal part of speaking. We've done it here today. You know, like there are things that it's actually perfectly normal and we want students to kind of get beyond that sense of always trying to be absolutely perfect. I really, really want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate you know, not just your time, but the wealth of expertise and, and knowledge and examples that you've brought to this conversation to really help our viewers with this opening kind of episode of our podcast series. And I want to share with everybody that we will have some resources available that will accompany this episode in particular. So we will be looking at providing for our viewers obviously a direct link to some of the things he mentioned, such as the actful can-do statements, which are going to be critically important for designing your instruction as well as your assessment tasks, a link to his book, The Keys to Assessing Language Performance, and some sample performance rubrics that you know, help you kind of visualize what it was we were talking about when we were talking about those single point and two point rubrics. So again, thank you so much, Paul. We've really appreciated having you here today. Thank you so much. What a pleasure.